for those few prelude tunes. I had wondered if I had missed a call this morning that church was canceled and it slept right through it. Because when I got over here, there's still a bit of snow about. And I was in here for a while by myself. <laughs> Charm sure that. So I was reassured that we were indeed holding service, otherwise I would have been out walking up and down the street. I'm so prepared for today. <laughs> so welcome all of you to the Tabor Congregational United Church of Christ on the fifth Sunday after Epiphany. Five Sundays into Epiphany. We have a few more to go. We go clear up till the Sunday right after Ash Wednesday. Then we start Lent. So Ash Wednesday is March 6th. And by then, we may have one or two weeks of white. <laughs> this is white. This is really white. <coughs> this is all the things that happened after the first and second century in Christianity. They made up rules and colors and things that we were supposed to follow. So I think we're okay. Um, one of the announcements I have is that we're going to start a new book study. It's a book called On Religion by John Caputo, which I've referred to in some of my sermons last summer. Um, we're going to go for, it. the books have already been ordered, five of them are available through the Iowa Library Association. Um, get a copy and read the first half, it's a very short book. Larry will have it all done in two hours. Um, I don't have study guides available yet, but you'll have some questions. It's a very readable book. One chapter is on Star Wars and the theological implications of Star Wars. It's very current. Um, anybody's welcome. You may have to double up on the books. We'll have to see. I did extend the invitation to Harry since he said that the book study was the highlight of his month, and I said I couldn't believe that, but he attended for two weeks and enjoyed himself. And there's a lot of historical references in this, especially to Augustine, one of my favorite characters. What's the name of the book? It's called On Religion by John Caputo. I don't know if it's available in audio, at least from the library here, and I looked I don't think I can get it on Kindle. I do have a copy back in Omaha for myself, so the other five copies are available for um, individuals or couples. And um, there's going to be a $3 borrower's fee. Yeah, that's, that's a typical fee we uh, charge for postage. Oh, okay. Because they, they ship them in yes. to the library. So it's a good book. It's a good book. Um, and if something happens and it's not in by the middle of this week, we'll extend the time or we don't have to have the group meeting on February 18th. We can postpone it a week. I like to do them on Monday nights if possible so that I can stay that extra day. And I don't know if we're going to have coffee and treats in the minister's office, but I do have some donuts we can parse up one, two. We might have enough to each have a quarter of it. <laughs> a bite for the council meeting. My daughter's bakery. I should have grabbed more, but I, that's all I had this morning. I didn't get a chance to bake cookies. Um, and we want to keep in our prayer, <coughs> prayers and thoughts, Karen and Doc Roba, his son Kenneth, Barb Kilpatrick, Evelyn Howley, who may still be over the manor. Or is in transition back to her house? She's at the manor. Oh, she is. And she may go home this coming week. I should have asked for her there. I didn't. I didn't realize she was in the manor. I thought she was in the home recovering. No, she. Okay. To go go home and things check out. And again, if you have any members or anybody who haven't been with us lately, please invite them to come with you to a Sunday service. <laughs> And we have one correction in there, the celebration hymn, and I'll announce this again when we sing it, is Holy, 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 and it's actually hymn 262, not 88. I'm not sure how that, well, that's an 88. Um, so with that, are there any other announcements? It says 88. But it's yeah, it's 262. 262. It's going to be 262. Two sixty-six. Two sixty-two. 
holy, holy. She changed it totally. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's holy, holy, holy. But is the one two sixty two. You'll recognize that when we sing. Yeah, there's a holy, holy, and a holy, holy, holy. I know there's all kinds of holy, 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 holies and holy. This popular, popular song title. <laughs> You'll recognize. We'll, we'll, we'll get through it. We'll, we'll sing something. Yeah, we'll sing something. <laughs> Okay, there's no other further <coughs> announcements. <coughs> Council meeting, we covered everything. I think we did. Um, <coughs> would you please stand and we'll do the call to worship. <laughs> One, two, and six. Holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. Our hearts are filled with thanks, O oh God. We bring before you our songs of praise. All rulers of the people are called to praise God. All people of the earth are subject to God's rule. The steadfast love of God surrounds us here. We have come to see and hear and understand. Let the thresholds shake with the power of God's voice. Let all the people tremble before God's glory. God's purposes endure and will be fulfilled. Our lives can be channels for God's grace. Amen. And now we will sing, Holy, 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 verses 1, 2, and 6. Is that the next six, no. so let's do all. Do them. We're going to do them all. Okay. Red Hand Roll 262. We don't have an accolade.
was so pleased when I can do that because I was denied that opportunity when I was a youth at the Lutheran Church in Irwin, Pennsylvania. It gives me great pleasure to do it now. Okay. Please join me in the opening prayer. God, whose presence fills this gathered place of gathering, we bow before your majesty in awe and wonder. When we consider the vast universe of your dominion, we are humbled by your attention to us. Your steadfast love and faithfulness amaze us. Your care for the lowly gives us a sense of our own dignity and worth. Send your gospel to teach us, to save us from ourselves, to lead us into all truth. Show, show us the tasks we can accomplish for you and grant us the courage to reach out in your name to do them. Amen. Um, we will now have a few moments of fellowship. We join together in singing Faith of Our Fathers, which I believe is the correct number, right in number 279.
sounded like some big dog barking. Oh. <laughs> we won't tell her you said that. <laughs> so you're traveling for those out on the road today. Yes. Well, please join me in a pastoral prayer for all our joys and concerns. Dear Heavenly Lord, we ask that you bless us during this cold, bitter wind and cold weather. We ask that you look favorably upon those in our congregation, like Mary Lou Crom, those at the Tabor Manor, Karen, Jock, his son Kenneth, Evelyn, and Barbara, and any others there who are all struggling with their illnesses, failing health, hoping for healing and your blessing and recovery. We ask that our leaders on high levels and low levels <coughs> try to have a sense of justice, fairness, and human dignity in striving for power and positions. We ask that you bless our president and all of his cabinet as they come and go and try to fulfill leadership responsibilities in a very difficult age of social media, television, and two sides arguing and fighting. We ask for peace and calm that our leaders not be distracted by earthly problems, but look to you for guidance and courage. We ask that you take care of our travelers in this bitter cold and of snow, and that you bless us in many ways and give us the gift of discernment to see our path. We ask this in your name and that of your son, Jesus. And we pray to you as Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Please join me in reading the prayer of confession and assurance. Awesome God, we are afraid to admit the ways, many ways we have failed you. We are sinful people who forget to thank you and who delay consulting with you about the decisions we must make. We prefer the safety of familiar programs even when they are ineffective. We cling to our routines even when they cause us to lose sight of your purposes. We fall down before you, asking forgiveness. Stand up, people of God. Our Creator reaches out to lift us up and deliver us from the troubles around us and the distress within. God touches our lips to cleanse us and take our sins away. By the grace of God, Christ comes to us, reclaiming us, showing us a new way, empowering us for effective service. Amen. Our Old Testament reading Today is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. And again, the, the New International Version. This is Isaiah the prophet's commission. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cry, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. He said, Go and tell this to the people. Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And then I said, For how long, Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without an inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted, and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away, and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Now there's a footnote here. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10. In the Hebrew, Septuagint. It's worded this way. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. This people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. We will now have an offering if someone would like to make a treat. Your presence has moved us to respond. 
Send us where you want to go. Use the resources we dedicate here to empower others to witness to your love and care. Fill our lives with thanksgiving. Fill our days with purpose. We rededicate ourselves to work and worship, but express our profound gratitude for life and all its opportunities. Amen. We will now read the affirmation of faith, found in the front cover of the red hymnal. We believe in God, the eternal spirit, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Father, and to his deeds we testify. He calls the worlds into being, creates man in his own image, and sets before him the ways of life and death. He seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. He judges men and nations by his righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, he has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to himself. He bestows upon us his Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. He calls us into his church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be his servants in the service of men, to proclaim the gospel to all the world, and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. He promises to all who trust him forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, Courage in the struggle for justice and peace, his presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in his kingdom, which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him. Amen. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. My subject this morning is Baptism, the History, and Jerome. Here we are still in the season of Epiphany, and it's the fifth Sunday after January 6th, or Epiphany Sunday, they call it that Sunday. We have three more Sundays to go until we get to the Lenten season with Ash Wednesday on March 6th this year. I promised we would cover more on Sermon on Baptism in the near future. Well, the future is here now. I will get to John the Baptist next week, as I think his story deserves an entire proclamation. We covered some of the history of baptism briefly last week, so here's the refresher. Baptism is a sacrament of admission to Christianity. The forms and rituals of the various Christian churches vary, but baptism almost always involves the use of water and the Trinitarian invocation I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The person may be wholly or partly immersed in water, the water may be poured over the head, or a few drops may be sprinkled or placed on the head, and pouring it on the head or sprinkling is called a fusion. Now how many of you were baptized as infants? 
How many as adults? Anybody full submersion? I'd like to do it again someday, soon. Do we have a tank hidden here somewhere? Did any of you have an epiphany at your baptism that you can recall? If you were baptized as an infant, you may not remember any of it. And this is the argument of some of the Christian world against infant baptism. Just remember this issue when I mention it later here. As for the story of Jesus' baptism, as you recall, John was down by the river doing his baptism ritual on any interested converts when the true Messiah appeared in the form of his cousin Jesus. So this moment for John and anyone who saw the heavens open and a dove appear must have been an epiphany. John realizes just who his cousin he has known for a long time really is. That must have been a big surprise revelation to him. Maybe not. John the Baptist, who is considered a forerunner to Christianity, used baptism as the central sacrament of his messianic movement. He was already doing this baptizing ritual before his cousin showed up. We'll learn more about that when I cover John in detail next week. But history tells us that there was a Jewish rite similar to baptism called a tevila, which is a full body immersion, and another form, which is the washing of the hands with a cup, in a cup. References to ritual washing are found in the Hebrew Bible and are elaborated in the Mishnah and the Talmud, their religious scriptures. They have been codified in various Jewish law and tradition. These customs are most commonly observed within the Orthodox Judaism. Ritual washing is not generally performed in Reformed Judaism. So John, we realize, was just using the Jewish rite that existed because these people were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. John the Baptist was a sort of renegade Jew doing his own thing. Christians consider Jesus to have instituted the sacrament of baptism if you don't realize that there was really a Jewish rite preceding the Christian baptism rite. The earliest Christian, Christian, excuse me, the earliest Christian baptisms were probably normally by immersion, and especially in a moving body of living water, which they considered the river or a lake. There were probably other methods of using water. A fusion is the pouring of the water on the head, as I mentioned. We can't assume from medieval and Renaissance paintings and stained glass, like the one on the cover of your order of service, however, that certain saints and church icons were really baptized as depicted. Jesus' baptism has been portrayed in hundreds of various manners and scenarios. This is what biblical scholars research and argue about endlessly. By the third and fourth centuries, Baptism involved catechism instruction as well as exorcisms, laying on of hands, and the recitation of a creed. In the 16th century, Martin Luther retained baptism as a sacrament, and this is our heritage as Protestant and Congregationalists. Anabaptists denied the validity of infant baptism, which was the normal practice when their movement started, and they practiced believer's baptism instead, meaning that you would have to be a believer, more or less an adult, and aware of what that means to receive baptism. Now think about all this here so far. Does this change your view of baptism? People often do not know why they believe what they are told to believe, especially if we don't all spend four years studying in a seminary. I never realized what I thought about baptism until I was made aware of the history. Would you do your baptism over again if you could? I would. I would like to be present and adult and understand the ritual when baptized again. So I sort of agree with some of the Anabaptists in that respect. I still honor it as a sacrament. Not that I do not appreciate my parents' intentions in baptizing me as an infant in a Lutheran church. So when the weather is nice and warm, maybe we can all go down to the Missouri or I can ask Bob Benton to bring in a big old animal trough some Sunday. However, what we have to realize is that it is not the way the baptism is done, but the intention in using the water and in performing the baptism that's important. 
And Jesus' baptism struck me that this event in Jesus' life and in ours makes this an epiphany of grand proportions, the opening of the heavens. The heavens are opened in the three gospel accounts of Jesus' baptism and torn apart in the gospel of Mark. In Luke chapter 3, verse 21, we are told, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too, and as he was praying, heaven was opened. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, we learn, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. In John, first chapter, verse 32, then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. In Mark chapter 1, verse 10, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn apart and the Spirit torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. So what difference does this detail make that the heavens are opened? Interpretively, we know what it means. That means that which we know that it means that that which separates us from God is no longer. That God is no longer behind the firmament, up in the clouds, at a distance, but God is here among us. We know all of this, but do we believe it? Do we get it? And do we live it? Sometimes we need a reminder that baptism is an epiphany kind of moment. Epiphanies are not subtle. Yes, we can look for God in all kinds of people, places, but sometimes God comes crashing through the clouds and stops you right in your tracks. Baptism should do the same. We can talk about the importance of our baptismal identity, the importance of remembering baptism commitment daily, but you have to know what difference it makes and be able to give witness to it in language you and others can understand. So this is where the heavens opening really matters, it seems. There is an intrusion here, an inability of God to be separate from whom God loves, whether we like it or not. We tend to define that as grace, the unmerited love of God. But there is something about the radical image of God pulling apart the boundaries that we set up to protect ourselves from God, that make epiphanies, and baptism for that matter, makes it a little less safe. Our baptismal observances are rather tame. A few drops of water, a dressed up recipient, parents and sponsors, a candle, some affirmation words from the congregation, maybe even applause. But Jesus' baptism reminds us that we should not get too comfortable with our baptism. This is not to say that we question God's intentions, God's actions, or God's desire to make us God's child. It's to say that God choosing to be with us, or God choosing to be one of us, or God choosing to make us God's own, should be its own epiphany. We get to see the true character of God, our God who would risk security and safety, laud and honor, distance and determination, so that God would know what it means to be among us and be us. Baptism is boundary crossing. Baptism is risk. Baptism is God's presence when we may not want God so close. If we are honest, the heavens opening can be good news and not, not such good news, depending on how close you want God to be and what you want God to see and who you want God to think you are. Baptism is about promise, the promise of God's love and grace, God's protection and provision, and the comfort of God's community. But Jesus' baptism reminds us that baptism is also an epiphany, and what God chooses to reveal about God's self is not always seen in white gowns and water. God renders the heavens open, God pushes through the firmament, and then says, yes, you, you are my beloved. This we know. This is the importance of witnessing Jesus' baptism as a remembrance and promise of our own. But at the same time, this cannot just be a moment of gratitude, 
It also need, needs to be a moment of awe, not just a moment of reliance on our baptismal promise, but a moment of rediscovery of who our God really is. Not just a moment of security and steadfastness, but a moment of certainty that when we look for God, we should actually be looking for the heavens being opened. And when that happens, everything changes. We need this kind of epiphany season, an epiphany that doesn't settle for God's appearances in the usual, but that trusts in God's inbreaking when we least expect it. To give good news to the poor, sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to realize that God's favor is for all, especially those whom our society rejects, overlooks, and continues to regard as undeserving of justice, and insists are not really worthy of God's love. The heavens are being opened, and during this epiphany season, it's important to give witness to God's interruption, imposition, and interference. This indeed might be the true meaning of baptism. My suggestion of a book study on the book Open by E. Scott Jones, the head minister of the First Central Congregational Church in Omaha, to those of you who heard about it last Monday at the book study, as a possible, it was a possible interruption, imposition, and interference. I realize the subject of gay people involved in churches and ministry is very uncomfortable. But imagine my surprise when I got the same uncomfortable reaction from the Tabor Ministerial Association last Tuesday. We have obviously chosen another book for our book study now, and the Tabor's minister group is not going to sponsor Scott's talk and book signing. And Scott's okay. He's understanding of the situation. But I sincerely pray that this congregation might become a leader in embracing uncomfortable subjects in the church as much as it embraced uncomfortable subjects back in the day of the abolitionist movement when this church became a sanctuary of sorts for those who were being oppressed. Perhaps this is our destiny, that this church live again into its role as a gateway for oppressed peoples. That is what this church was known for. That may well be where God is calling us now. We will all have to pray and discern what our calling is in this regard. I seem to have started a discussion on this uncomfortable topic as one of the Tabor ministers approached me after the meeting and said he's dealing with these issues in his own church right now and he wants to talk more. So the door is opening. And for now, we can all relax and be aware of our possible Christian calling and discerning our path on this future map. To repeat some statements I made previously to summarize this message here today, Sometimes we need a reminder that baptism is an epiphany kind of moment. Epiphanies are not subtle. We can look for God in all kinds of people and places, but sometimes God comes crashing through the clouds and stops us in our tracks. We ask Jesus Christ for the gift of love and discernment in determining our path. We ask this in your name, a loving God. Amen. We will now have a closing hymn, Children of the Heavenly Father, Red Hymnal 44.
Maybe it's your blessing from the front today. <laughs> God has touched us amidst our pain and fears. We have been comforted and blessed. We have felt a healing, restoring presence. God is leading us through troubled times. Here we are, ready to be sent into the world. We will go where God directs to share good news. Go in peace. Amen.